Um, you know, they, they going into business for yourself is risky. Um, 80% of all new businesses fail in the first five years. People are afraid of that. Um, especially people who are in, you know, safe corporate environments. Sometimes they may have, you know, great benefit packages. They may be walking away from bonuses or um, uh, promotions in the future. Uh, and so, you know, the fear of losing all that and potentially going out of business is very strong. Now, I will say with franchise businesses, you know, we flip that on its head. 80% of franchise businesses are still going strong after five years. Um, some people do very, very well. I mean, there are, you know, franchising has made lots and lots of millionaires out of really ordinary people with just, you know, uh, either strong corporate backgrounds, even blue collar backgrounds, people that can follow a system. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode. On today's episode, we're going to dive into the franchise world, specific to what do franchise brokers do. And we've got a great guest today. We have Keith Lissio. He's also uh, a member of FBA, which is the Fran Franchise Brokers Association, and they actually are a very good trade association. There's there's like four or five trade associations out there, and franchise brokers basically align with one of these associations. They house the inventory um, for us to help you find the right business. So we're going to dive into a lot of kind of questions and dive into what does a franchise broker do. Uh, Keith's got a very uh, amazing background. He's been around the franchise world for a while. Uh, he's his his family were business owners. Uh, Keith was a, had an import export business at one time, and the, he spent the last twenty years before he got in the franchise world owning a search firm. So he was a a headhunter, a recruiter, whatever you want to call it, which actually goes hand in hand in what we do as franchise brokers, consultants, etc. So welcome to the show, Keith. Thanks, Bo. I'm really pleased to be here. Thanks for having me. So, Keith, one of the first questions I had, Keith, for those that are new to the field, could you explain what a franchise broker does and why someone would consider working with a franchise broker? Okay, sure. Essentially, Bo, I, I serve as a coach and consultant to people that are aspiring entrepreneurs. So often, you know, people know that they want to be in business for themselves. They, they may not have the next great idea. They're not Steve Jobs. They're not Ray Kroc, but they're really successful in their careers. They manage systems. They manage people, operations, sales, marketing. Uh, they're very good at moving things along in a given process. And so for people like that, franchising is a terrific opportunity. The issue is there's over 4,000 different franchises for sale in the United States. And you could literally spend months or years researching the best one for you. And that's really where, where we come in. So we have assessment tools that we use. We help to get uh, a good sense of uh, people's backgrounds, their financial capabilities, their values, their preferred working environment. And I can match them to very specific franchise opportunities that'd be a really good fit for them. So that's sort of my process, kind of introduce them to the discovery process, make the appropriate introductions with franchises that uh, will be a good match for their skill sets, and then offer support along the way. I want to help them to make their best impression, put their best foot forward. And if they need help um, with accounting, uh, legal, financing, I can make referrals to all of those people to kind of keep the process moving forward. Very good. So unpacking this a little further, from your perspective, what are the common barriers that hold people back from jumping into entrepreneurship, especially in franchising? Uh, the biggest one is fear. Um, you know, they... they Going into business for yourself is risky. 80% um, of all new businesses fail in the first five years. People are afraid of that, um, especially people who are in, you know, safe corporate environments. Sometimes they may have, you know, great benefit packages. They may be walking away from bonuses or um, uh, promotions in the future. Uh, and so, you know, the fear of losing all that and potentially going out of business is very strong. Now, I will say with franchise businesses, you know, we flip that on its head. 80% of franchise businesses are still going strong after five years. Um, some people do very, very well. I mean, there are, you know, franchising has made lots and lots of millionaires out of really ordinary people with just, you know, uh, either strong corporate backgrounds, even blue collar backgrounds, people that can follow a system. 
but sometimes they're just afraid to get started. And so what we help them to do is kind of face those fears, um, understand what their limitations are and how they might be able to overcome them, and then help them move forward in the process. Very good. Could you share a success story where you helped an individual find the perfect franchise opportunity? And, and to add on that, what made it a great match? You know, there, there's a bunch. Um, I guess one of my more recent placements was with a candidate who had a very strong sales and marketing background in the wine and spirits industry. And and at, when I was an executive recruiter, that's where I originally made contact with this person. Um, uh, she was a candidate of mine at some point in the recruiting business. Um, she touched base when she learned what I was doing. She actually... Um, lost her job and announced that she was pregnant at almost at almost exactly the same time. So she had um, a really unique situation in that she had just tons of time. She was essentially on maternity leave, but didn't have something to go back to. She had tons of time to evaluate lots and lots of different options. And so we took her through um, the process. Um, she was really diligent um, and a really good um a, a good candidate because she really kind of submitted to the process. Uh, she took the Zoracle profile, which kind of gave me a good sense of the kinds of businesses that'd be a good match for her. Uh, we picked probably a half dozen that were really interesting to her. Uh, she made introdu made introductions to four of them, and she did really, really thorough uh, uh, due diligence on each of them. Uh, with probably three of them, she went you know right down to the discovery day process. But by that time, one of the choices just really, really emerged as the best choice for her, her lifestyle, her future. Um, it was a business she could operate from home. She now had a young baby, um, and uh, she's uh, she really hit the ground running um, in that new enterprise. What What do you feel it takes? You know, I know every candidate's different, but in, you know, from a kind of an average standpoint, how many concepts would you say that most of them want to see before they kind of lean towards one that they want to? to invest in? Is it five? Is it seven? Is it eight? Yeah. You know, this is something I've kind of gone back and forth with. And, and I had um, one of my my mentors in this business um, really kind of, I think, made me lean towards presenting more candidate, more pro, uh, concepts rather than less. I mean, typically I think, you know, we've been trained to pre 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 provide six to eight options to candidates. Um, and I think for most candidates that works well, but you know, when you've got a candidate, especially, you know, um, people that are real thinkers that like to evaluate things, if you don't present them enough options, they feel like they haven't seen enough. They feel like they haven't, um, evaluated their, their opportunity fully. So, you know, I've presented as many as 20 or more. And in, in cases like that with certain candidates, you know, what, what my mentor told me is, that, you, know, you know, I could take the 20 or 30 that could be a fit for them and narrow it down to six or eight. But but really, I'm just using my judgment at that point. You know, there may be other options that are a better fit for them. And for some candidates, they just really need to see that. Others, they really just kind of tr trust the process. They trust the system. Uh, we do have a back-end system that helps match people to specific opportunities. And after I kind of get to know people, I can kind of narrow it down. But some people just like to have more options. Um, so, you know, I would rather present more options up front than present six options and they're not quite happy and they want to see more um, because it just kind of it, it, um, extends the process. The, the problem, of course, when you have too many options, it's, it can be overwhelming for, for candidates. So, you know, I want to I want to limit it, but at the same time, provide them enough that they feel like they've seen enough choices to make uh, make initial decisions. As you um, kind of ended your search firm that you owned and, and got heavily involved in the franchise world, I mean, a lot of the the superpowers that you used owning and placing uh, people in their career in the search firm goes hand in hand with the franchise world. How did, how did you, I mean, I see a lot of people in the search world that get into the franchise space and they seem to excel because you have certain skills you develop over the years. How were you able to transition and what's kind of your superpower that you took from your, your career in the past into the franchise space? Um, well, I, I don't know if superpower may be overstating it, Bo, but um, I, I think the really the thing I'm really good at is um, establishing rapport with people and, and listening to what motivates them um, and, and, and figuring out kind of what, you know, 
what kinds of things they're looking for in an opportunity. You know, is it work-life balance? Is it profitability? Is it more time with their family? Um, and then kind of moving them into the right opportunity for that. You know, I'll tell you my, my transition from recruiting, um, when I sold my interest in my recruiting firm, you know, I thought maybe I'd even retire. Um, I took a part-time gig doing some financial um, analysis for a, for a company and I, I did some payroll work for them and, you know, just had a kind of a little part-time opportunity, but it just wasn't satisfying for me. And so I originally got introduced to the franchise world because I was looking to buy a franchise. I, th I thought, you know what, I'm not ready to retire. Let me do, I don't want to start another business from scratch. I'd done that a couple of times before. And so, you know, I, I started looking for franchises to buy. And in the course of looking for franchises to buy, I sort of stumbled upon this idea of franchise brokerage, which really, as you said, you know, with my recruiting background was really a much better fit for my skill set than any particular franchise might be. And, and I think that's one of the things that I really do bring is that, you know, I can look at a person's life situation and, and through conversation with them and listening to what their wants and their needs are, I can kind of help them focus on the kinds of businesses that will work best for them. You know, often, you know, when people come to me, they often have a very specific preconceived notion of something that they think that they want to do. And when we kind of go through the process, they sort of, you know, you're opening their eyes to possibilities they just never even imagined existed. You know, most franchise um, people that are interested in franchising think of things like McDonald's or Taco Bell, quick serve restaurants or what many people think of as, as franchises. But as you know, we have businesses that range from advertising to vending machines and everything in between, home service businesses, work from home businesses, um, businesses that people don't even know exist. And so that's kind of, I think, the key that we bring forward is we can show them things that they wouldn't stumble across on their own and help them find opportunities that really work well for them. Yeah, that, it's pretty interesting as most people come in and they're thinking, oh, I want this sub shop or this this, uh, you know, Toastique or whatever these ones. And then they realize, well, it's not just these quick serve restaurants. It's, you know, these home, these non, you don't need brick and mortar locations for a lot of these concepts. I think that's what amazed me the most is that I had no idea before I got in the franchise world, how many opportunities are out there and how you can get started relatively with low, you know, capital, which is yes. important for a lot of people. Yeah. I've got a great um, example. Let's dive that. into. I, I, oh, excuse me. No, I had a, no, I had go a ahead. candidate go ahead. Yeah. Who, um, who came to me. She had been a bench scientist. So she basically did research work for universities and corporations. And then she took time off. Um, she had a baby, took time off to raise her little girl, um, and then was ready to get back in the workforce. And her initial response was, yeah, you know, I think what our town really needs is a good breakfast restaurant. You know, what kinds of franchise do you have that could, could show me that? And so... You know, we, we went through the Zorical profile and I got a good sense of kind of what made her tick. And while she could have been happy, I think, running a restaurant, even though she had no restaurant experience, and we have plenty of restaurants that kind of will, will kind of teach you what you need to know to do that. Two things sort of deterred her. One, um, the cost. I mean, opening a brick and mortar restaurant, you know, you're talking a minimum of five, six hundred thousand dollars for most of them. And two, she really had you know, she was somebody that really liked helping other people. And so, you know, she could have gotten some satisfaction from providing people with a good breakfast. But I ended up putting her in a position where she she ended up buying a franchise for a company that does um, visitation monitoring uh, in the court system, the juvenile court system. So lots of times when people get divorced, um, you know, for one reason or another, they have to have supervised visitation. And this company helps people to do that. Something that she never would have considered. Most people don't even know this business exists. Really, really high profitability. Um, um, low startup cost. She was able to get into her own business for far less than $100,000. She's working from home. She has plenty of time to spend with her kids. She's helping other people. It was just for this person, it was exactly the right opportunity and something she never would have found on her own. And that, that's an owner operator model mostly, or can you actually hire, um, you know, other yeah, I mean, employees uh, I think many people start by actually doing the visitation, but it, it pretty much is, um, you know, you're managing other people. They, there's a lot of um, 
licensed social workers that do this kind of work. And so, you know, they, they, um, uh, unfortunately, you know, the, 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 the work that they do and, and lots of these, most of these people are very educated, they have master's degrees. Um, the pay rate is very low. So she can actually offer them work that pays more than what they're doing at their, their regular gig. And they can fill in with this. So she's kind of overseeing a network of social workers that kind of monitor these, um, that handle the visitation for her clients. Was that, was that, a, that angel monitoring? It is angels monitoring. Yep. Yeah, the other thing yeah, I like I, about that them. company, Bo, that that you know they've got another pro, uh, another project that's in the works, and and people who who buy into that get both both um, modules now, but they may actually split them off. The other one is going to be medical monitoring. So you know the the thought is you know when people, especially elderly people, go into the hospital, um, you know maybe grandma falls and breaks a leg. So she, mm -hmm. you know, everybody rushes to the hospital to take care of her, be with her while she's there. Well, eventually people have to go back to their daily lives. And if you've ever been in that situation, it's really hard to, you know, make contact with medical professionals, you know, physical therapists, doctors and whatnot. And so what they're also doing is they've set up a, a, a business where um, they uh, adhere to all the HIPAA requirements, but basically they have the authority to you know, track a, a patient's progress. Um, doctors are, are permitted to talk to them. Nurses are permitted to talk to them. And then they can report that information back to the family. So um, they're, not, they're not authorized to make any decisions. They're not healthcare proxies, but they communicate with the people that are authorized to make the decisions and um, provide them with up-to-date information so that people can um, uh, keep better track of what what their loved ones are going through. I think ultimately that's going to be a bigger bigger business for them than even the vi the visitation business. Um, and and right now, if you buy one, you get both. So it's it's kind of a cool. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, yeah. No, that is cool because I did look at them. Um, and I think that's important, kind of to, to segue into this part. Is is what do we actually do? What do you know franchise brokers do other than what Keith explained? Is you know, there's a lot of learning in this, but this is a never ending process for us as franchise advisors and, and brokers. We're, we're, we're on meetings a couple of times a week. We're constantly looking at inventory, having calls with the, the franchisors, learning more about the business model. What I really was attracted about in this business is that the, the complexity of matching and figuring that out is an art. Okay. Like I've never been. We don't really, I don't consider us salespeople at all. What we do is we're advisors and we really help the process through and through. And we're, we're not charging the candidate. You don't pay for this service, which is amazing because I, when I started the lending business, Keith, people would come to me and they're like, Hey, I'm buying this. I want to buy this Wetzel pretzel franchise. And I'm like, well, what, what else did you look at? And they're like, I didn't look at anything else. You know, I just like the pretzels. And I think, when people start to understand what we do and how we can be of service to, to them and really like, you know, like if you find the right franchise broker, they're not going to be trying to slam you into things. There's a difference in franchise brokers. And that's why I ended up with F FBA. And I probably, Keith can attest to that, is that you you want somebody that's, you know, constantly learning, that's not just referring you to the, the franchise Zors, right? And like making an introduction and then seeing you later. You want somebody who's going to be with you throughout the process because there's a lot, a lot of steps, a lot of hand holding, and a lot of educating, a lot of checklists and conversations. Because a lot of the people that come in that have been W2, and I think Keith, you can attest to this, is that they don't know what they don't know. Meaning, like when they're trying to figure out, well, how does this business really run? What, do, what would I do as the owner? How does it? All these different models. It's a very complex sales process, uh, which I don't even think it's sales. It's really advising. How do you? T what's your take on this? Like, explain to the world about, you know, how we're constantly learning and educating because it's not like you're going to figure this out. It's it's an evolution uh, in in really understanding different models. Models. Some models are in high demand right now. Some models will slow down at some point. Kind of walk them through like what, you know, emerging franchises are and what, you know, more established franchises are and a little bit more about the process of how we 
you know, constantly are, are helping match and what we do in the background. Okay. So I guess this is a good, a good place for me to make a plug for the Franchise Brokers Association. You know, as you mentioned, there's a number of these brokers groups out there. And I will say that all of them have successful brokers. The thing that set the FBA apart for me was the ongoing mentoring, support, and training. Um, you know, we're not, we're not salespeople. Um, you know, even though, you know, our role is, is really a broker, we're bringing a buyer and seller together. Um, we really do take more of a coaching and consulting role. And, and that's, I think, something that really sets, you know, our training really sets us apart from other brokers in the industry. As an example, you know, you mentioned, you know, the inventory. I mean, we have hundreds and hundreds of options in our inventory. Um, and that, as, as I started this business, it was kind of hard to kind of get up to speed and learn all the different options, but, but it's ongoing. And we add new, new companies to inventory every week. Um, so, you know, the, the, you were constantly on speed rounds or, or, you know, con conferences. Tomorrow I'm heading to Philadelphia for, um, a, a confirmation day for FBA brokers. We're going to see Joshua Tree Experts. Uh, it's a terrific franchise. Um, and again, a business that people don't really know could be a franchise. They basically do tree service. So, you know, if you have trees in your yard, they need to be planted. They need to be maintained. They need to be pruned. Um, they also do, um, maintenance, lawn, lawn work. They also do pest control. But one of the things that we do is we go to their facility. We see their franchisees in action. Uh, we get a presentation. So we really know the ins and outs of this business. And then we're in a better position to present that to the right candidate. Now that I, I will say that that option would not be the right option for many of the people I come in, in contact with, but that that's kind of what we do. We sort of, you know, see what makes somebody tick and put them in touch with the people, the businesses that might be the best fit for them. And it's not for us, it's not a sales process. I'm making an introduction. Um, often I'm making an introduction to somebody who is going to go, you know, have a sales process. They're, they're trying to sell their franchise, but I stay involved throughout the process. So the candidates I'm working with might be looking at two or three or four different options, all of whom are trying to sell them something. And I can help them sort of evaluate the options in a way so they don't feel like they're in the, in the process by themselves. And again, you know, we have access to terrific franchise attorneys, terrific franchise accountants, finance specialists. It's very rare that anybody, you know, buys a franchise and just writes a check and, and goes into business. Almost everybody needs to finance it in some way, shape or form. And so I can help match them even to the financing specialist. That's the best one for their situation. So they're, they're not in it alone. They, they always, you know, the, the maxim about franchising is that you're in business for yourself, but not by yourself. And by using a franchise broker, it's, it's very much along the same lines. You're looking at this process for yourself. It's your business, but you're not by yourself. You've got a, an advisor that you can trust to look out for your interests and help put you in the right position. I love that. Looking ahead, what do you think 2024 will bring for the franchise industry? Are there any specific trends or shifts we should be anticipating? You know, I think as the economy starts to stabilize, inflation is coming down, um, we're post-pandemic, um, I think you're, you're going to see some some minor changes. I mean, uh, the the quick serve restaurant industry, for instance, was hit really, really hard by the pandemic. Um, you know, when they closed everything down, you know, lots of people just couldn't survive that. Um, that said, you know, many of our operators adapted their businesses. So businesses that really didn't do a lot of carryout business, didn't do a lot of DoorDash or online mobile mo ordering, really kind of adapted their business and became better companies because of it. So I think you're going to see a, a lot more of that. Um, also, you know, home services seems to be, you know, the really hot trend. Um, you know, these are, are recession-proof businesses. They're pandemic-proof businesses. Often they're Amazon-proof businesses. Um, and so I think, you know, that's going to continue to be a real growth area for the industry. For those just starting out to explore franchise opportunities, what key piece of advice would you offer to help them make informed decisions? 
get as much information as you can and don't do it alone. Um, you know, as I mentioned, there's 4,000 franchises in the United States and often people, you know, have a preconceived notion, whether it's Wetzel Pretzel or Chick-fil-A, um, they see something they like, you know, they like the product. And so they think that's the best business for them. When often, you know, there's so much more to running the business than just the product. So, you know, working with a broker, um, we can really help you to, first of all, to see options that you don't know exist, and then to help you narrow your, your options to the opportunities that are best fit for you. What surprised you the most um, well, as you're going through all these different franchise concepts? What what sector or industry, and we don't have to be specific, but what really surprised you uh, from like a, a standpoint of like the revenue potential and the and the lower startup costs? Uh, and then, you know, kind of going after that, you answer that, can you kind of talk about how somebody coming in to, to the, to look at business ownership and how they, uh, how they're pleasantly surprised on finding a business that they would least expect they would be wor working in? Sure. So, um, and I guess I'll talk to both ends of the spectrum. At, at the lower end, you know, there's a lot of these, especially these home service businesses, where the startup costs are just remarkably low. You know, often you know, a hundred to one hundred and fifty thousand dollars, sometimes less, and the profit potential is enormous. Um, you know, there's there's very low overhead. Um, you can often start them from home, so you don't even have to have an office or a staff. Um, you subcontract out the work in, in many of them. Um, and, and, and I think, you know, people don't understand that you, know, you can be in a real business that has, you know, real profit potential, um, for relatively low cost. Um, and, 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 and what many of these people do is they'll either commit to buy multiple territories up front or as they sort of scale their business, they add on adjacent territories. And, you know, people are, are doing, you know, six, you know, seven figure revenue, um, very, very quickly and, you know, high six figure incomes, you know, that they just never even expected. And, and also at the lower end, I mean, there's businesses, you know, vending machines, um, very scalable businesses, very low, you know, initial entry costs under, you know, 50 to $60,000 probably. Um, and these are businesses that you can start in just a few hours a week. Um, and, you know, they pay for themselves quickly. Um, the vending machine business, one of our, our companies, I think over 90% of the people that buy machines from them end up buying more machines. Um, they're just very profitable, very scalable, and they help you do everything that you need to know. They help you place the machines, help you learn to merchandise them. Uh, they're very, very, they're very um, sophisticated. Um, so people, you know, with, without a lot of money can, can get up and running fairly quickly. Um, with not a lot of investment. And at the other end of the spectrum, you know, we have people that are looking for passive or semi-passive opportunities. Generally, these are a little bit more expensive because, you know, there maybe there's more infrastructure that's required and you have to hire a manager or you have to hire somebody to uh, to oversee the business. But for some of these in just, you know, five to 10 hours a week, um, you know, you can be up and running in a business that can supplement your existing business or your existing career. Um, and make a very nice return for yourself. So, you know, there's, it really runs the gamut it, it, and it, it very much depends on the person, their skill set, their capabilities, their financial situation. But if somebody's really serious about getting more control of their time, their life and their finances, we can find the right business for them. Yeah. That, that's also a good point is that a lot of people are doing fairly well with their W2 job and maybe they don't even want to transition out for at least a couple of years. So that's also how we get to have a lot of those conversations like, okay, well, what makes sense? And then the other day we had actually Keith, you're on the call, I believe we had the, the CPA and we're diving in, right? Because there's so many tax benefits as being a small business owner versus being W2. So yeah. I always try to kind of give full circle the advantages of business ownership. I've been a business owner pretty much my whole life um, since I was 20 years old, 21 years old. So I think, if you're out there right now, there's never been a better time to be a business owner. You can, you know, most of these franchises are SBA financeable. You can finance up to 90% of all the costs. Um, I just helped a guy with get a loan actually, and he bought that one painter. 
and it was oh, uh, great business. And, and his all, his equity injection was just eleven thousand five hundred dollars. That's it. Wow. Uh, 11, you know what I mean? Like, and he's built he bought built in like thirty or forty thousand dollars of working capital. So we can help those type of people. We can help yeah. executives. And that's what's and that's fun about what we do. that's an executive model. So, you know, people think, you know, you, you mentioned a, a, a brand like that one painter. People think, oh, I, I don't want to be painting houses. Well, that's actually, you know, the guy who started that company, he was a painter. He didn't want to be painting houses either. So he developed this executive model where, you know, you're subcontracting out the work. They're helping you with lead generation and you're kind of overseeing it all. Um, so that's that's a great that's a great example of what people can do. And, and as you mentioned, tax benefits, you know, for many of these people, you know, there's an investment involved, but there's write offs involved, too. And for many of these people, you know, their um, their tax liability at the end of the year goes to zero because they've got write offs that they can from their business that they can apply to their taxes. So uh, the benefits are, are huge. And sometimes people don't um, pay enough attention to those financial benefits as well. Yeah. Keith, this has been a great conversation. Where can people find you? What's your website? Uh, my website is uh, my company's name, ExcelsiorFranchiseCenter.com. Uh, I'm available on LinkedIn. I'm available on Facebook. Uh, you can lo- link to me directly or to Excelsior Franchise Center. And I'd love to have an introductory conversation and see how I might be able to help you. Great. That was, that was awesome. Thanks, Keith, so much. Guys, this channel, we're, we're bringing on different guests. We're going to talk about business ownership. We talk about franchise, obviously. We talk about you know what, what a franchise broker can do. We talk about SBA financing. We talk about business acquisition. We basically talk all things business ownership. So uh, appreciate you guys following. Please like and subscribe and share this with colleagues. We're really trying to help you know thousands of people over the next 10 years buy their own business, start their own business. Uh, we're here to help. We're here to you know give you support, and we're here to tell you if we think business ownership might not be the best thing for you as well. <laughs> Thanks so yeah, much, Keith. Hey, Bo, thank you very much. I, I appreciate your time today. 